Well, now let's see how I do with this particular chapter. I have recorded a lecture of this chapter in previous years, and uh, the problem with it is, is that it came close to two hours in length, and that, not quite that much, and I really want to pare this down for you so that you don't have to spend so much time on this topic. There's a couple different reasons for this for me. First of all, you know, I spent a whole semester talking about social welfare and the history of social welfare in my introductory 106 class, and so I'm taking a lot of information and kind of putting it into a short lecture, and that's kind of difficult. The other thing is, as I've told you, I'm very fascinated with history, American history in particular, and even more so presidential history. And so you're going to see that I find an intersection between these two areas of interest in this lecture. And I'll be referring to the presidents and their impact on policy at several points during the course of the lecture. So I just hope you find this material to be as interesting as I do. So we'll see. Our social welfare history really stretches back through many centuries. While we oftentimes think of the English poor laws as being the basis for our social welfare programming, and it is a significant influence, it's not the only influence at all. Judeo-Christian teachings, of course, uh, go back to the times even before the birth of Christ and provide for the unfettered provision of charity and relief for the poor when it's necessary. Now, there are, in fact, some historians who believe that actually Judeo-Christian charity wasn't quite as freely given as history says it is, but nonetheless, it's certainly one of the principles, and it was one of the values in the talk that we uh, went over quickly regarding the nine American values as seen by Phyllis Day. The feudal system developed, and in this particular system, in the Middle Ages, the lords developed a protective and caretaking role for the poor people that were known as serfs, and the exchange was that the serfs raised the crops and provided the castle and the lords and their knights with food and those kinds of things. In exchange for that, they were protected from marauders and outside invaders, let's say. This was a system throughout a couple of centuries, I believe, throughout Middle Europe at least. But then industrialization occurred or began to arise at least, and the feudal system collapsed. And in the early 1600s in England, a set of laws were established called the English Poor Laws, which were intended to give communities some direction in terms of how to find the ways to deal with the band of dispossessed serfs, now known as vagabonds. We call them homeless today who were going from community to community looking for work and looking for care in the interim. And there wasn't a lot of work in the early cash economies, so this was quite a problem. The poor laws have spelled out responsibility for tending to the needy and, and was really the earliest system of taxes, I believe, at least in capitalistic countries. It did establish restrictions on who could receive care and who could not. These were the earliest forms of residency requirements and also gave communities the opportunity to worn out those vagabonds who were becoming too dependent upon the community, in other words, you know, giving them a few days to disappear from town, and also was the earliest basis for differentiating between worthy poor and unworthy poor. And there'll be more on that uh, in this talk. The colonial laws really reflected a lot of the Elizabethan welfare system, and th this really made the parish or town councils and the residents of those communities responsible for each other. In the 1700s, almshouses began to appear. We call this indoor relief as opposed to outdoor relief, which is providing cash to persons to help them get by. The communities who couldn't fund almshouses began to auction off the poor and apprenticed out children. I, I'm sure you've heard about apprenticing kids. And, and this is really the early underpinnings of the foster care system, even where children from poor families were essentially given to artisans and craftsmen and business people in exchange for raising those, uh, those children and teaching them how to make their way economically, the um, businessmen also had their free labor. By the end of the colonial period, responsibility for the poor shifted from the towns to the larger colony or the state as those governments began to organize more and uh, residency requirements and warning out were used a lot by local communities. The able-bodied unemployed were placed in workhouses or almshouses later in that century. But by the early 1800s, workhouses became the primary mode of assistance for those who were considered to be the unworthy poor, those who, who might be able to work but weren't working. Dorothea Dix advocated for improved services for the mentally ill and understand that a lot of those able-bodied, unemployed persons were mentally ill, but it wasn't recognized so much as an illness yet. And the 10 Million Acre Act was implemented by Congress in the, I believe, the 1840s, which essentially set aside a bunch of federal lands and the income generated from those lands would be used to support services for the mentally ill. 
But our 14th president, Franklin Pierce, vetoed that when it came to his desk, saying that the federal government should not have a place in taking care of the needs of poor people and mentally ill. By the middle of that century, there was some acknowledgement of a limited responsibility on the part of the federal government to tend to the needs of the poor and needy through the veterans assistance programs following uh, the Civil War, and also the Freedmen's Bureau, which was established to help the slave population, the freed slaves, to find a place in society. But that was dissolved by Congress uh, seven or eight years after the end of the war. Voluntary associations really were the basis for a lot of the provision of services in the 1800s and particularly inadequate when the industrial era began in the 1800s and special institutions and services had to be created. In addition to that, there was a very large influx of immigrants late in the 1800s and into the 1900s, mostly from Europe. And also there was a migration of individuals from the farms to the cities, really even before the 1930s. But there was a move towards urban populations. So the so the population centers really had a lot of social service needs and didn't always have the funding necessary to provide for those needs. Some protection for women in the workplace began in the early 1900s. Women really started working in factories at the onset of the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s, and it was the first time really that women found a role outside of the home, and oftentimes were living independently and alone, young women in particular working in factories. But uh, there was little protection for women. If you've ever read The Jungle, you know a little bit about that with the trials in um, Ona in terms of her relationship with her boss. And this was not atypical in this time. Child labor restrictions also came into place in the early 1900s, rather, and also compulsory education laws came into place. A lot of times we, we think that This was because we began to realize that children had special needs. And to a certain extent, that was the case. They were no longer seen as little adults. But at the same time, there were were economic uh, crises in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And they needed to get uh, jobs freed up for able-bodied men. And and again, the emphasis on men here. And so really, these uh, child labor laws and compulsory education laws also intended to get children out of the workplace and to free up jobs for men. So understand, a lot of the legislation that you see in terms of social services often has a basis in servicing the capitalist system and the needs of that system. Although 10 out of 12 workers were affected by industrial accidents of one nature or another, no workers' compensation or disability insurance existed really until the early 1900s. You began to see some of that, but uh, very little at that time. And so if you were injured on the job, you had no job protections. You had nothing to help you. There was certainly no health insurance or anything along those lines. And so you and your family were just out of luck. And at a time when children were pushed out of the workplace as well, that could become quite a problem for for families. There was a lot of graft and corruption by the political machines and in the business world at that time, and really they kind of run everything. As a result of that, muckraker journalism began to emerge around the turn of the last century that exposed a lot of the problems in society. Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle. This is a book that I refer to a lot when talking about social welfare history. And he was one of the muckrakers. There were other uh, muckrakers that don't come to my mind at the moment, but this was, they were sort of a thing in those eras and were really disliked by those in the establishment. And I often compare the muckrakers of the early 1900s to Michael Moore and his ilk in the filmmaking of the early 2000s and the late 1900s. They really serve much the same purpose and also have much the same dislike by a lot of the population. In the 1800s, social Darwinism, which was one of those nine American values, really began to take root. If competition for scarce resources is nature's law, then the poor suffer because they can't compete, according to this particular philosophy. And the wealthy are entitled to their spoils because of their fitness. And so aiding the poor and even allowing the reproduction really was opposed to nature's law and it weakened the human gene pool as well. So aiding the needy towards what was believed to be the evolutionary progress of humankind. And those who were involved in helping the needy were seen as perpetuating poverty and perpetuating dependence in the system. And so this is the early social workers in that time in the charity organization societies focused upon getting people to work and really were not at all in favor of handing over money to those needy individuals at all. So there was no cash assistance during that period of time, at least to amount to anything.
Religious institutions did provide some release, but still, when you think back to those Calvinistic roots that said that work was a moral imperative, you can see how poverty then would be seen as a moral failure, that work was really a duty of any God-fearing person. And so, therefore, economic success really displayed that God favored you and your population. So really, the rich had it good in many ways. You know, not only were they favored by God, but if they wanted to, they could atone for their sins by donating money to a poor relief. And and so they were really kind of guaranteed entrance into heaven. Neglecting the poor had a lot of religious backing in those days, even though religious institutions were often the ones that were relied upon for relief. The untrained volunteer, mostly middle and upper class women connected to churches were the earliest social workers, and they had the belief that the poor have to be taught to live moral lives. A lot of their work focused upon spiritual guidance, and if the aid was given, it was tied to demands for changes in behavior such as abstinence from alcohol. Here you see that combination of social assistance and social control. The charity organization societies began in 1870. I referenced them a few moments ago. These societies coordinated relief provided by various agencies. There there was a lot of duplication, also a lot of corruption and graft in those agencies. And so the COSs were intended to oversee this and to coordinate the provision of services. And out of that came the friendly visitor, which again may be the earliest of the social workers you, you read about that really, uh, while they were there to help by teaching morality to to these uh, poor people, you know, really they were also conducting an investigation into the clients' lives. And in an interesting kind of way, that was the earliest form of social research into poverty and formed the basis of of a rethinking of how to uh, help the poor and what the causes of poverty was. The child-saving movement was also popular in the late late 1800s, Children were at one time placed in almshouses with the able-bodied, unemployed criminals and the mentally ill, and uh, it was early on seen to be uh, not good for children, and so this is how the apprenticeship system developed. Also, many of children later in the 1800s and early 1900s were sent out west to work on farms to help the farmers who were trying to establish the nation out there. And this was all a part of the child-saving movement, sending orphans to the West by train and those kinds of things. And, of course, the farmers got free labor from that. Did you ever watch A Little House in the Prairie? I know I'm dating myself. The series was on television for years and years. And you may remember Little Albert. Albert was adopted by the, the Ingalls family. He was picked up as an urchin on the street and taken out to the Ingalls farm. And he was a good example of that, in fact. Although the Ingalls family did this on their own, it wasn't a government program, as I recall, that put Albert with them. Jane Addams was an upper middle class or wealthy young woman who was sent to England by her family to to study for a while. And she came across the settlement house phenomena in England and brought it back with her to the United States and began this in the very late 1880s. Mostly in urban centers, the settlement houses were established in, in the heart of cities and tried to work across class differences to help neighborhoods to organize, provide adult education and literacy classes, and in particular to teach the language to poor and immigrant individuals, those kinds of things. This involved, again, wealthy women moving into poor neighborhoods, living in the settlement house, and gave the workers some insight and knowledge into social and economic conditions in the American cities. These workers became very strong advocates for social reform rather than fixing individual problems or preaching morality to to the needy individuals that were the kinds of practices of the COS, the friendly visitors. Of course, Hull House in Chicago, you may have heard, was the most famous of the the settlement houses that were established by Jane Addams in uh, 1889. Jane Addams has uh, also, while she's revered in social work, in many respects, has also come under some scrutiny because of her. Her philosophy basically involved assimilation of immigrants into the the population and kind of making them white. And again, in in our current view of of race relations and culture and and those kinds of things, this isn't seen as positively as it might have been 100 years ago or 140 years ago. You have to consider this in the uh, context of her times. African-American associations began to spring up to service the needs because there were no government programs to help African-Americans. And so mutual aid societies were really what African-Americans relied upon 
in many respects. And and uh, some of the earliest African-American universities were also developed during this period of time. In the early 1900s, the progressive era sprung up. During the administration of Teddy Roosevelt, he instituted some reforms in the business world known as trust busting, where he broke up some of the large conglomerates in the oil and railroad industries, not unlike the same concerns that you hear about today in regards to tech industries like Google and Facebook and those kinds of things. There was a real concern about the control that these large corporations had on the market. Again, the muckrakers were involved in in, uh, exposing a lot of the social conditions. At the same time, socialism was establishing itself all over Europe, certainly. With the immigrants moving into the United States from Europe, there was a great deal of concern about socialism being spread into our capitalistic society. And this is one of the reasons why immigrants were mistrusted in many respects and rejected in this era, despite the fact that they contributed quite a bit to the economy. After World War I, progressive ideas were treated skeptically and the liberals were often accused of being Bolsheviks themselves. And so the social work profession at this point begins to move away from social reform and to focus upon individual change. And it's in an attempt of the profession to to guard its acceptance in society. The Milford Conference in 1923 is famous for providing an outline for casework agencies to be housed in the community and to derive objectives from the community itself. So it became a model of human service delivery and a way for the profession to apply its skills. There's still some element there of community input and uh, perhaps community change in that, but again, primarily the focus is upon casework. The Great Depression also was involved in taking that conservative backlash against the progressive era and putting it on its heels because, uh, you know, there was just a lot of people who were never poor and never had needs before suddenly were destitute. And so government became a major source of aid for the needy during this time. But Herbert Hoover, who was the president at the time of the uh, collapse on Wall Street in 1929, was very reluctant to involve the federal government in direct relief at all and instead focused on propping up businesses as a way to put the nation back on its feet and get the economy moving again. He believed that individual assistance should come from voluntary organizations such as the Red Cross. And in fact, he was, I believe, even designated to be the president of the Red Cross uh, because he put so much faith in Red Cross to resolve human needs. But the voluntary sector's funds were soon exhausted because people weren't able to donate money to, to the voluntary agencies. So Hoover lost his bid for re-election in 1932, and Franklin Roosevelt was elected, and he proposed a new deal. In the first 100 days of, of Franklin Roosevelt's uh, administration is famous for all of the social program changes that were implemented. And every new president's first 100 days are measured against what Roosevelt did in those 100 days, perhaps unfairly. He addressed the collapse of the economy with a a number of aid programs and reforms for both the business community and for the individual. His inaugural address was famous for having his line saying, the only thing that we have to fear is fear itself. He established a bank holiday because there was a concern about a run on banks, people wanting to take their money out of banks, and also established a Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC, which today still protects your money up to a certain amount that is well beyond the reach of most of us in terms of uh, savings accounts, but uh, it insures your money against loss in banks. The Federal Emergency Relief Administration and the National Industrial Recovery Act were created to provide assistance to states and local communities and also to give federal control over work sites and provide public works projects. But he had a very conservative Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court declared some parts of both of these laws unconstitutional and forced changes in the program. There was a lot of frustration on his part and his administration, and there was quite a bit of discussion in those days about packing the court with four new justices so that there would be 13 and he would get the liberal imbalance in the court that he needed for his programs. But that uh, program never got off the ground. It wasn't, uh, wasn't very popular. And you might recall that as the election of Joe Biden approached late in 2020, there was discussion about the possibility of packing the court with the addition of all those conservative Supreme Court justices that Donald Trump's administration uh, brought about. So you see, history does repeat itself, and it's really worth knowing about these things.
The New Deal program had a number of programs, and, and uh, it was often referred to as alphabet soup because of all the letters involved. The Homeowners Loan Corporation that involved helping individuals get new mortgages. The AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, to uh, provide surplus foods and also to allow farmers to limit production so that farm prices can be stabilized. Farmers were beginning to be paid to not raise crops to, in order to help farm prices not plummet. In addition to that, surplus foods, uh, there was another way that the excess food that was being grown during those times were distributed to the needy. This was the early forerunner of the food stamp or SNAP programs. But instead of giving the individual the option of what they wanted to buy, instead they were given commodities, peanut butter, and I don't know, all sorts of other things in large cans to take home to their, to their families. FDIC was established. The National Youth Authority gave jobs for young Americans in school and college. The Civilian Conservation Corps employed men between the ages of 18 and 25 to uh, go out and engage in conservation activities around the nation. Many of our, some of our national parks, I guess I should say, were established because of the CCC. The Works Progress Administration funded skilled and educated individuals to be employed in a lot of projects around the nation. And this went everything from construction and infrastructure to art and music. It was really, uh, this was the alternative to the uh, National Industrial Recovery Act and really provided some uh, amazing products during this time that still exist today. Many of the uh, older public institutions around the nation, the colleges and universities, have WPA buildings on their campuses still. And they'll be there till the end of time. I think they are just sturdy and beautiful old buildings. And also the Social Security Act arose from the New Deal to provide benefits to workers and families. And this was the alternative to the Federal Emergency Relief Act. So you see here, Roosevelt's New Deal focused both on assisting business and also in assisting individuals. There were also reforms in the workplace which were significant and that we still benefit from today. The National Labor Relations Act, the Wagner Act in 1935, established the right for workers to collective bargaining. They couldn't be uh, fired if they tried to unionize, and they had a, it also reinforced the right to strike. So this evened the power between workers and owners. Workers' compensation was largely established through the states during this period of time so that if an individual was injured on the job, there was some payment uh, and some assistance in getting medical treatment. And the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938 established then a 44-hour standard work week and the provision of overtime pay for anyone working more than that time. Now it's 40 hours, as you know, established the first minimum wage and also outlawed child labor finally, although that had been underway for quite some time. The Social Security Act is probably the big thing that we think about when we think about Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. And I just want to talk briefly about the SSA. There are three primary parts of the Social Security Act, and we're going to talk about those. First is the federal insurance for workers. That originally was old age and survivor's insurance. In 1956, disability was added. And also Medicare was added to that in 1965. So old age and survivor's insurance is really what we think about today when we think about Social Security, right? And dis Social Security disability. This is the Social Security check that most workers get. If you work 40 quarters and earn an amount that is considered to be substantial by the Social Security Administration, and that's all defined year by year. If you go to the SSA website, you'll see that. If you've worked 40 quarters, then you become eligible for Social Security when you retire. Also, you, you are eligible for disability payments from Social Security if you're unable to work any longer. Also, unemployment compensation was established for the first time on a federal level under this particular provision of the Social Security Act, so that if you were laid off or fired for unjust cause, you had the benefit of some money while you sought out other employment. The second part of the Social Security Act was federal to state categorical assistance. And so look at that title and break that down. The federal government providing money to the states for categories of individuals who needed assistance. Old age assistance, aid to the blind, and aid to dependent children. The difference here is, is that these are for individual workers who hadn't worked 40 quarters. And certainly in the first uh, 10 years of the implementation of this act, nobody worked 40 quarters. And so this was the this is sort of the way to make sure that people who left employment because of age or disability were not cut out of any kind of income at all, as well as, well, I'm going to get to ADC in a minute. But um, 
This included aid to the permanently and totally disabled as well after 1950. Medicaid, the health insurance program for this population, was added. And in 1974, this was all federalized. Old age assistance and aid to the blind and disabled was federalized to become SSI. SSI is essentially the Social Security program for individuals who haven't worked their 40 quarters and, and contributed to the system. It is a, a needs-based program, and it's closer to what we considered welfare, I suppose, than Social Security. Quite frankly, Social Security is every bit as much of a welfare program as SSI is, and I know workers would dispute that quite a bit, but the fact is that it's not your money you're getting back after you retire on Social Security. Individuals who are working at that time are the ones who fund your retirement. That's, that is the essence of, of public welfare. But another discussion sometime. Aid to Dependent Children at that time, ADC, was, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but it was established to assist mothers in caring for the children and to keep them in the home, keep mothers in the home. In 1950, the caretaker was added, so it became Aid to Families with Dependent Children, AFDC. And in 1962, well, okay, it was renamed AFTC in 1962 and uh, eventually became what is now known as the Temporary Assistance to Needy Families Under Welfare Reform, the TANF programs. In Alaska, that's ATAP, Alaska Temporary Assistance Program. And you notice the, the temporary in those titles. That's uh, another issue. But uh, this was to help families with, with mothers children with mo mothers with children, I should say. And then finally, the last part is the Maternal and Child Welfare Act that provided for the care of homeless, dependent, and neglected children. And ultimately, that evolved into child protection that we see today through state legislations. Child protection systems run by the state, but it is monitored and partially funded by the feds. That really didn't get started. Child protection didn't really get started until somewhere in the 1960s. Crippled children's services and other health programs like public health programs and those kinds of things also were a part of this. So you see the expansive nature of the Social Security Act and how this has really provided so much for the needs of other individuals. And this is so interesting that it is so much under attack by conservatives oftentimes, but the public has become jealously possessive of their benefits. And uh, it would be a, a cold day in hell probably before this program gets eliminated, I believe. Two footnotes about this before we move on. The ADC program, the Aid to Dependent Children's Program, was originally intended to be a program that was designed to allow mothers to stay home and care for the children rather than work. Now, get that. We were going to allow mothers to stay home and not have to work so that they could be there with their kids when they grew up. But it became an unpopular concept. It was put, rather than being in the Health and Human Services Department, it was put under the Department of Labor. And so the focus turned to the unemployed parent, particularly when that parent was added to the grant when it became AFDC in the 1950s. We're, we're talking about unemployed mothers now. We're not talking about the needs of kids. And, and there are work requirements for unemployed mothers and all those kinds of things. It's a very different program than what it was originally intended to be. Likewise, there's no program in the Social Security Act for universal health care. And, and uh, this was uh, actually a part of it in its early stages, but was there was intense lobbying by the uh, American Medical Association to have it taken out of the package. And uh, I could give you all sorts of reasons why I think that's the case. And some 60 years later, when uh, Bill Clinton first became president and his, his wife Hillary headed up a task force to establish a national health care program for the United States. There was a great deal of resistance to that as well in those days. And to be honest with you, a lot of the um, unpopularity of Hillary Clinton goes back to this particular effort. There were just a lot of people who seemed to be resentful of a woman being in charge of such an effort. And really, the same resistance is in the Medicare for all, uh, the resistance to Medicare for all efforts these days as well. We are one of the few nations, developed or otherwise, in the world that doesn't have a universal health care program of one nature or another. After World War II, there was a new Red Scare program, not unlike during the Bolshevik rise of socialism in Europe. And after World War II, there was another Red Scare, largely fanned by Joe McCarthy, who is a senator from Wisconsin, I believe. And the House Un-American Activities Committee was formed. I believe that still exists today and resulted in the, in the regression of a lot of the progressive reforms that were evident in the New Deal and even going back to the progressive era for that matter. Even though the uh, Social Security and AFDC programs saw some expansion during this time, otherwise there were virtually no new welfare programs proposed after this. 
1962, Michael Harrington wrote a book called The Other America. He read a short passage from that in uh, week one's assignments. This book dispelled this myth that had developed in the prosperous 1950s that Americans enjoyed unsurpassed comfort and revealed that there was a large subculture of poverty in America that were anything but comfortable. Civil rights saw some progress in the 1950s with the Brown versus Topeka ruling and in the 1960s, but again are seeing some regression these days with some recent court rulings undermining voting rights and restricting affirmative action programs, and we'll talk about that in a few moments. Women's rights also became more active in the 1960s, particularly after the advent of birth control becoming readily available to all women. The structure of the family, you know, relying on patriarchy, was really beginning to be challenged in that era for the very first time. Like men now, women were able to separate their sexuality from pregnancy. Lyndon Johnson was president throughout most of the 1960s and implemented a war on poverty, and overall his program he, he worked for what was called a great society, which attempted to address the problems of poverty through programs such as those listed here, the Office of Economic Opportunity, Operation Head Start, uh, which we still have at least some semblance of Head Start these days. And, and some of these programs continue, although many of them have, have gone by the wayside. What remains of most of these programs, perhaps with the exception of VISTA, are sad, sad shadows of, of the programs that were proposed in the 60s. His programs were intended to enlist the participation of the poor and the local communities in implementing these programs, but it failed because local politicians really undermined the efforts to, to give more power to citizens, and the bureaucrats were very uncooperative in doing so. And so, in many respects, these programs failed. But the percentage of people living in poverty fell from uh, 25% in the early 1960s, 25% in the early 1960s, to about 12% in 1969, and more or less, that is, ups and downs, that's kind of where it's been since. A lot of that has to do with the implementation of uh, Medicare and Medicaid, which, which uh, relieved a lot of individuals of the burden of medical expenses. There was a lot of legislation and Supreme Court rulings in the 60s that promised the expansion of civil rights. Uh, the Civil Rights Act of 64 allowed, rather outlawed, discrimination based on race, religion, sex, or national origin and included in voter registration and in schools and workplaces. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 cut down barriers that prevented mostly African Americans from voting, and again, mostly in the South. Some of these provisions were struck down by the court ruling in 2013. One of the provisions was that states that were particularly suspect in their efforts to exclude African Americans from voting were kind of put on a watch, and they had to demonstrate to the federal government, I don't know, annually or some periodic times that they were what they were doing to ensure that they were not excluding African American and minority voters. And in 2013, the Supreme Court ruled that, oh, that wasn't needed anymore. You know, we've all progressed beyond that. And so they eliminated that provision from the Civil Rights Act of 64, or 65, rather, the Voting Rights Act. Of course, you know, you've heard a lot about, for instance, in North Carolina in particular, efforts to uh, redistrict and restrict voting uh, through such things as, you know, voter ID and, and those kinds of things. Medicare and Medicaid established in 65, the food stamp program, which is a department of the United States, is a program of the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA. And again, while it is there to help the needy, it also, now it's called the SNAP program, understand that it's a program of the Department of Agriculture, and that tells you it's there to help farmers. And indeed, because poor people can buy more food now, farm production is supported. And that doesn't just benefit the poor. It also provides assistance to those individuals who truck the produce from the farms to the markets. It, it helps uh, grocery stores and the individuals who work in those grocery stores because more people are buying food. It helps the economy. So this is the sort of the self-defeating nature of the interest of the Trump administration to cut back in eligibility of the SNAP program for individuals who weren't working. The Older Americans Act of 1965 instituted a lot of programs to assist the elderly. The Civil Rights Act of 68 outlawed discrimination in housing. This was largely um, due to Martin Luther King's efforts as, as he continued the civil rights movement after the establishments of many of those rights in 64 and 65. 
There were more amendments to the Social Security Act. The Mental Health Act uh, eventually established uh, the funding for the community mental health centers that you're now familiar with around the nation. Also provided for significant social work education funds. It was a big deal in the 60s. And then there were a number of Supreme Court decisions extending rights to individuals. The Miranda ruling, the Galt decision, which extended the adult protections to juveniles. Loving versus Virginia, which outlawed marriage discrimination between races. Roe v. Wade, during this period of time, it really was an expansion and advancement of, of human and civil rights, almost all of which are now under some threat of regression because of the conservative court system that we have. And there has been a retreat in general, politically, from the progressive changes. Power and money has shifted from the states under Nixon and under Reagan. Or rather, it has shifted to the states, I should say. And so that allows the states to make a lot of independent decisions. And, you know, you compare the programs, let's say, in Mississippi to the programs in New York State, or even in Alaska, for that matter, and you can see the impact of, of this kind of thing. There isn't a lot of uniformity in many of these programs. Although the feds keep a toe in it and work to guarantee some consistency, the states have a lot of power in making decisions about it, particularly since Reagan and his block grant programs about how the money is distributed and who gets the money. Interestingly, Nixon was a little more liberal than most of us think. He was a very moderate Republican, although he was criminally inclined. But he actually proposed a family assistance plan to, to provide a basic family income around the United States that was defeated by Congress. Now, some say the SSI program, which was established during his administration, was really the result of that effort. But he had a, a more expansive kind of focus in his proposal. Reagan, and like many of the Republicans that you may be familiar with now, subscribe to the trickle-down theories of economics, the idea that you provide money to the wealthy and the benefits of that will trickle down because they'll invest their money in the economy. And, and so all of us lowly workers will benefit from the rich getting all the money and getting all the tax breaks. And again, I'll say we've seen that over and over again through the George W. Bush tax program and also in the Trump tax reform in 2017. Likewise, the moral majority became politically powerful and was very influential in its leadership with its cultural conservatism. And that very much extended through the George W. Bush administration in the early 2000s. And I found it very interesting that the fundamentalists, the religious right, continued to uh, support Donald Trump despite his exhibitions of unchristian-like behavior in his life, uh, continue to support him as their leader, I think largely because of his stated opposition to abortion. We saw an increase in homelessness. We saw a decrease in real income, less industrial jobs, and those industrial jobs, which largely were unionized and so provided for a decent income for many workers, was replaced by low-wage service industry jobs, many of which are not unionized. And so, so now the, the blue-collar worker is in much, much worse conditions than they might have been in the 50s and 60s. Bill Clinton got elected promising to end welfare as we know it, and indeed it happened, although his welfare program was pushed significantly to the right by a very uncooperative Congress led by Newt Gingrich after the uh, midterm elections in his first term in 1994. Out of all of this, the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act, which has the worst acronym, PROA, that I have ever seen in a program, it was passed in, and signed in 1996 and brought about these changes to the welfare program, renewed the uh, efforts for social control by attaching lifestyle demands to the provision of assistance and placed lifetime limits on how long assistance could be received. I already mentioned that comprehensive health care reform failed in 1993 and uh, the healthcare care industry stayed fairly consistently opposed to it, although you'll hear a lot of doctors now tell you that they think the Affordable Care Act is a good thing. Republicans took control of both houses of Congress in the early years of Clinton's administration, and they proposed this contract with America, which was a very restrictive and punitive effort to reform and punish poor people. Among some of the uh, proposals, Newt Gingrich was famous for suggesting that rather than providing cash assistance to mothers, unemployed women with children, put those children in orphanages and they'll, they'll be better off. And that harkens back to the social welfare policies of the 1830s and 1840s. But that's our newt. <laughs> and uh, I, I will tell you, he's still out there and politically. I think, you know, he's run for president a few times. I think the odds of him ever being elected now are pretty slim, but um, 
He was quite a Grinch in those days, trust me. The conservative Congress and at that time somewhat conservative courts really kind of pushed the Don't Ask, Don't Tell and Defense of Marriage Acts through. Don't Ask, Don't Tell, meaning that if you're gay, you can be in the military, but don't tell anybody and the military was not supposed to ask about it. But if it became known, there were still grounds to dismiss someone from the military. The Defense of Marriage Act was intended to guarantee that marriage was defined as a union between a man and a woman. Now, Clinton has signed both of those, has since said, that, particularly in respect to DOMA, that he didn't want to sign that, but he knew that if he didn't with the conservative Congress, that there would be an effort to pass a constitutional amendment to put that provision in the U.S. Constitution. And so he figured it would be better to sign it into law because the law could be overturned. It would be much harder to change if it became a constitutional amendment. That's just a little asterisk in in Bill Clinton's legacy, I guess. You know, he's, he's kind of unpopular for signing these acts, but he had a lot of political pressure to do so. George W. Bush, his advisors did a kind of a smart thing, I guess, for getting him elected. And they saw to it that in in many of the states in the 2000 and 2004 elections had provisions in it that had something to do with defense of marriage or other LGBTQ rights issues that they were put on local ballots. And so that was guaranteed to draw out those conservative religious thinkers and get them to the polls. And that meant George Bush was going to get more votes. It was a successful strategy for him. Although Al Gore won the election in 2000 by popular vote, George Bush, and this is a you know a famous story, of course, George Bush uh, well, actually was made president by the Supreme Court in 2000. But uh, that's another discussion. The wars that were established during the Bush administration in Afghanistan and Iraq have dominated the federal budget and certainly did during the Bush years. And so it undermined any effort the Bush administration might have done to look at social programming. You know, he referred to himself as a compassionate conservative. We never really figured out what that meant. One thing he wanted to do was to privatize part of Social Security so that individuals would have the opportunity to control where their money goes, invest their money in whatever they chose rather than relying upon the government's investments. Ill-advised for a number of reasons, I believe. He really supported faith-based organizations providing services. Again, going back to that, while his father campaigned on an effort to establish a thousand points of light, you know, he really pushed volunteerism. And this is all in an effort to get the federal government excused from responsibility for providing for the poor. Barack Obama, the first African-American president, was elected in 2008. During his eight years in office, there was some advancement both by his administration and the courts in terms of individual rights. But once again, although there was a solid Democratic majority, 60 Democrats in Congress in the first two years of his administration, that changed after his first midterm elections. This is a you know rule of thumb for you if you're not aware of this, that in midterm elections after a president is elected, the party in control usually loses seats in Congress. So what that tells you, for instance, in the uh, new Congress that was sworn in in 2021, that when the 2022 midterm elections come around, that narrow majority that the Democrats have in the House and now the Senate may be rolled back. Puts an extra emphasis, I think, upon the importance of what has happened or will happen in the first two years of the Biden administration. But there wasn't as much happening in the first two years of the Obama administration as we might have expected with that. And indeed, in some respects, he was uh, slow to come around to some of the social issues. But we saw him grow in office. One of the earliest things he did was pushing through the Lilly Ledbetter Act, which provided more time to file equal pay suits. This primarily affected women who were paid less than men in the same jobs. Oftentimes, you couldn't get information about how much other people were paid, at least for several years. And the law said that you had to file an equal pay suit within X amount of time. And so women were often prevented from suing for uh, compensation under that law. And this this changed that. The stimulus package, uh, you know, as you know, Obama came into office during a, a period of severe financial crisis, the worst since the Great Depression. In his defense, perhaps much of his efforts in the first two years had to focus upon economic recovery and the bailouts of Wall Street and and the auto industry, which, although unpopular in certain segments, kept our economy afloat and got us back on track. 
Finally, in 2010, the Affordable Care Act was signed into law, and this included Medicaid expansion, where families above the poverty line could uh, receive Medicaid, working class families could receive Medicaid if they met certain income guidelines. Alaska's Medicaid expansion program was called Denali Kid Care. The appointment of two women to the Supreme Court, Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor, both liberal-leaning, and the appointment of a moderate Supreme Court justice, Merrick Garland, was blocked by Congress late in the second term, very famously, because uh, Mitch McConnell and the Republicans said that there should not be a confirmation of a Supreme Court justice during an election year. More on that in a moment. Marriage equality was established when the United States Supreme Court ruled in the Obergefell versus Hodgins case in 2015 that the fundamental right to marry is guaranteed to same-sex couples both by the Due Process Clause and the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. I believe this will be challenged. Just keep in mind, as will the advances with the Supreme Court being as conservative as it is under the Trump administration's, uh, due to the Trump administration's appointments, I believe that we need to be aware that there may very well be a rollback in civil rights for women, for racial minorities and ethnic minorities, for LGBTQ population, for the elderly, for the disabled. No population, not to mention the poor, no population is safe in the current judicial configuration, as far as I can see, at least. Uh, Whether Joe Biden's administration will alter any of this remains to be seen. Certainly, there will be some suggestions, I think, to return to a more progressive agenda by the White House. But the courts, with the uh, appointments of conservative justices, are going to continue to rule on the constitutionality of challenges to laws for a generation or more. So this may be something that will be dealing with for generations, barring any unforeseen uh, circumstances such as packing the Supreme Court, which I don't think will happen. Trump and his administration worked diligently to overturn virtually anything Obama, but certainly the main focus was the efforts to scrap or undermine the Affordable Care Act. Just an aside, by the way, you may not be aware of this, perhaps you are, but although Trump has been through that birtherism thing where he challenged that Obama was an American citizen. The enmity that he feels towards the Obama administration really, I think, was amplified, at least, if not birthed, at the time that he attended a White House Correspondents' Dinner. And that is a, an event that happens every year where the president typically kind of takes the stage and tells a lot of jokes uh, for all the correspondents that, uh, you know, that cover the White House. And, and there are a lot of luminaries invited to that. And Trump happened to be invited to that. I, I, I don't know, 2010, 2011. A lot of people believe, well, during that time, uh, Obama was reacting to Trump's pushes on the birtherism and and made jokes about Trump and the major decisions he had to make on The Apprentice, you know, whether to fire someone or not, and laughed about how he was sure that that kept uh, Trump awake nights. And everybody thought it was funny. But if you ever seen a video of this, Trump was not laughing. And a lot of people believe that's when he decided finally he was going to run for president. Of course, he had been talking about that for a couple of decades, but this uh, is said to be the event that pushed him off the fence and certainly colored his, his efforts to overturn everything that Obama tried to implement in his eight years. And the ACA was one of those things. And, and uh, while it's been stripped back uh, in many respects, it survives and may in future years be revived again. With the, uh, well, the public has come to recognize that uh, health care is an issue. Finally, and if nothing else, that's what the Obama administration did with health care is, is to help Americans recognize that they have a right to be able to seek and get health care regardless of their financial situation. As I mentioned, his appointments to federal courts have focused on increasing conservative judges. That's one of the reasons that he has the religious right and many, many conservatives behind him. Because, you know, Trump historically is anything but conservative, and he's certainly not religious. Three Supreme Court justices, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett, have all been appointed and are really notably conservative. And and really now, in the early years of the Biden administration, tips the Supreme Court six to three in favor of conservative thinkers. Trump administration was supportive of the state's effort to restrict and complicate access to abortion. I believe that uh, these efforts are going to bring Roe versus Wade back before the Supreme Court in the presence of this conservative bench. 
eventually. There have been attempts to pull back requirements for provision of free birth control for employees. Environmental regulations, the Obama era environmental regulations were rolled back in many respects, although interestingly, the Trump administration did not approve efforts by the Pebble Mine Group to mine in the Bristol Bay Area. And finally, Trump's efforts to restrict immigration and marginalized and in many respects demonize individuals from other cultures, other other races, other ethnic areas. A lot of it has been put into law. And of course, his efforts to build the wall between Mexico and the United States. These are things that I think are going to mark the Trump administration and be a hallmark of its legacy over the years. So what will Joe Biden do as President Biden-Harris administration has a promise to perhaps take us back into a more of a progressive focus in social programs? And it remains to be seen how successful they'll be. As I said, I'm guessing that they have two years with the current configuration of Congress to really carry out a lot of their programs. And so uh, we'll see. Again, uh, this administration has an economic crisis because of the COVID pandemic. There's an economic crisis that the Biden administration has to focus upon and public health crisis as well. It's going to take up a lot of attention in the early days. So we shall see. Jane Addams believed that the social profession must decide whether it is to remain behind in the area of caring for the victimized or whether to press ahead into the dangerous area of conflict with the, where the struggle must be pressed to bring to pass an order of society with few victims. To me, this is a policy statement. This is, this is very appropriate for those of you considering policy. And as I mentioned earlier, even if you are working in the clinical area, you will also have an opportunity to impact policy and, in fact, a need to be aware of policy and how it impacts your clients on an individual level and to advocate for change. For those of you that may be inspired to move on to policy as a full-time focus of their profession, there's much to be done. And I think it's an exciting time for social workers to be engaged in this process. Well, that's it. And I don't know. We'll see. I I haven't checked the time, but I think I've come in shorter than the last time, although I know I've done a lot of talking and I appreciate you bearing with me. I hope you found it interesting and useful to you. I also hope that if you have any questions or anything you want to discuss arising from this, please let me know. Bring it to class and I'll be happy to talk it over with you. Don't always let me set the agenda for the week. Thank you. And I'll talk to you later.